Perhaps if you sit in the middle. <laughs> I'll face. I'll be facing the camera better. <laughs> okay, this morning we'll be talking about uh, the most important subject that we talk about, which is what is proper soul and what is not. Um, we, it's a big problem in our industry in that our industry does not promote what we believe to be natural soil. So what we'll talk about first this morning is what our plants are requiring from the dirt. So if we draw a picture of a tree, when I was a kid, most schools at that time taught you that the roots were a mirror image of the branching but it's not actually true because of what the roots require. So if you dig up a tree that's maybe 30 foot tall and 20 foot wide, it will have a root system that's maybe one foot deep and 100 foot across. And the reason for that is that, uh, like us, the roots on plants need to breathe oxygen. So we know that the plants make oxygen in their leaves up here, but that's the only part, the green parts of the plant are the only parts that create oxygen, the rest of the plant's consuming oxygen. And because they don't have blood, blood cells like we do, our blood, red blood cells transport the oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body, they don't have that. So the oxygen that the leaves make, that the chloroplasts within the leaf cells make, exit through the holes and leaves, goes out into the atmosphere, 
the air travels through the soil to the roots. So the roots actually get the oxygen through the soil itself. Now, fortunately, roots don't need to breathe like we do. Uh, they get enough air just penetrating through the surface top foot of soil or so. Whereas if you covered us up with a foot of dirt, we just suffocate. So plant roots need less oxygen than we do, but they still need it. So roots can only go as deep as the soil allow them to breathe, which in most cities is about one foot deep. Um, so what plants require from the soil, number one actually is water. So the water's got the soil's got to be able to retain moisture. If a plant's actively growing, the roots have to be moist. The roots system of plants is not covered with wax like the foliage is. Uh, they have to be in contact with moist soil or else they lose all their moisture. Uh, you know, if they're out sitting in the air, they just dry up. So roots have to be surrounded by moist soil. So the soil has got to be able to retain moisture. So one is water retention. Two, though, is air flow because they have to be able to breathe. Now, all these are important, so I, I shouldn't put numbers on them, but three would be stability. It's got to be able to hold the plant up. And four, insulation. Roots operate between temperatures of about 34 degrees to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. They really don't like it. If the, if the roots are actively growing, they don't like it any colder than that. They don't like it frozen. They don't like it any hotter than that. So the roots actually insulate pretty well. The soil insulates the roots pretty well too. Now a couple uh, things to know is that the ability to hold water is called the porosity of the soil. If the soil is porous, it holds more water. The airflow is the permeability. And a lot of journalists get porosity mixed up with permeability. They'll say, well, clay pots breathe better. No, they don't. They're, you know, they say they breathe better because they're porous. No, they, they breathe better because they're more permeable than rock is or than plastic is. Porosity, clay pots have to be very porous, but that's, they suck water up. So porosity is the ability to hold water. Permeability is the ability to have the air go through there. Oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide from the roots comes out. They breathe just like we do. Now, that said, we know that there's a lot of variation among how much oxygen plants need in the ground. And that's one of the keys to, you know, if you want something easy to grow, the roots don't need that much oxygen and the plants that happen to be the ones that need less oxygen are plants like well grass is one so nobody usually kills their lawn from lack of oxygen uh, conifers like junipers and pines cedars cypresses uh, also don't need much oxygen a lot of these plants um, do things slowly so they don't they don't breathe that quickly Palm trees, another one that don't need much oxygen. Um, interestingly, we've got Bird of Paradise. Uh, one plant they have on the list is roses. And then you have the lilies and the irises. A lot of those uh, don't need much air in the ground. And in fact, uh, and then daisies, another one. And when you look at people's yards, these are the plants that most people have success with. Grass lawns, lilies, irises, uh, daisies, bird of paradise, pine trees, palm trees. Those are the ones that are easy to grow because um, no matter what we do to the soil, there seems to be enough oxygen for them. The plants we have trouble with the most are the plants that need more oxygen in the soil and the one of the most famous ones among our customers would be gardenia 
Everybody has, a lot of our customers have given up trying to grow gardenias. They just turn yellow and die when they have them because they need more oxygen in the ground. Um, we noticed that English lavender is, is probably the most sensitive plant we have seen. I mean, they'll die in just a matter of weeks if the roots can't breathe. A lot of the succulents rot real easy if the soil doesn't have enough oxygen in it. Now, the problem with our trade, too, is they're getting some terms mixed up. Um, they're claiming that these plants that die easy are being overwatered. Well, that's not the case. Uh, pretty much any plant likes it when it rains. It's not the water that's the problem. Uh, it is, however, the amount of oxygen in the water that makes a huge difference. Another one that a lot of our growers have trouble with because they were taught to grow plants improperly, one of the native succulents called Lewisia, which we love. This is one of the easiest plants we've seen to grow, but very few Native plant growers grow it because it rots so fast on them. And that's because they're trying to they grow it in the wrong type of soil. So a lot of the plants that are difficult are the ones that need more oxygen around the roots. Now, let's mention how much that means. So. Generally, our tap water has enough oxygen in it to keep plant roots alive. So you can grow, so we can grow a lot of plants in pure water. So tap water out of the tap, and the water districts know this because they've been told, you know, if they don't have enough oxygen in their water, um, the fish, any fish in fish tanks will be, will be killed. Plants will be killed when that when they water the gardens. So tap water is supposed to contain between six and eight parts per million oxygen molecules per uh, water molecules. When the oxygen level drops to about two to three parts per million, that's when a lot of the a lot of the sensitive plants start dying. They can't take that low amount of oxygen. There's a few plants that need even more than this. Orchids, a uh, few plants cannot live even in water because they need more air than that. Uh, orchids would be one. Uh, zellias are another one that need lots of oxygen around the roots. Uh, ferns need a lot of oxygen around the roots. Um, but six to eight parts per million seems to be a key now. The other thing to know about water is when water's cooler, in the wintertime it holds more oxygen. So we rarely see rotting in the wintertime. We see a lot of rotting in the summer because warm water can't hold as much oxygen. And root rot problems, uh, the main problem with plants nowadays is root rot diseases. They thrive under low oxygen levels. So summertime, you water a lot. The plants are rotting. People tell you're overwatering. Uh, it's now we'll mention. We'll tell you how this comes about. So, so anyway, let's first talk about what soil is and how it does these things here. Holds water, breathes, um, keeps the plant stable. Insulation too. So soil itself. Ideal soil is called loam, and a farmer wants sandy loam, but loam uh, means just, the term loam means that the soil contains the three major particles that, that make it work, sand, silt, and clay. Now, anybody knows what sand is. You go to the beach, you know what sand is. Um, well, let's, let's do this first. So what soil loam is actually made out of, if you take a piece of granite rock. Now, this may or may not be granite, but granite is the black and white rocks that make up countertops, the fancy countertops. 
but it is the main rocks in the ground is granite. If you go to Yosemite, it's all granite up there. The white parts of granite are quartz, silicon dioxide, which is the same thing as glass. Glass is silicon dioxide. The dark parts of, of this rock are feldspar, which is quartz or silicon dioxide mixed with either, in this case, I would say aluminum to make it grayish. If it was reddish, it'd be iron. Uh, manganese, if it's, if it's got those other minerals mixed into the crystal, then it turns it brownish or grayish. But that's still part of the, the, the granite rock. When this thing's broken down, you get dirt. So dirt is actually crushed rocks. And the industry is trying to sell you essentially ground up tree trunks and telling you that's dirt. But this is what dirt is. This sandy loam, you take this granite rock and crush it up. The uh, white parts in here become the sand and the silt. And the dark parts are the clay that make up soil. Now, the way it works, let's blow it up a little bit. Now, this is not quite the scale. The tennis balls are supposed to be the sand. Now, sandy loam and loam in general has been in a riverbed where it's been tumbled over and over. Um, and so you have different sized particles. But the particles, if you look at sand or soil underneath the microscope, you'll notice that the sand is very round. It's not quite perfect. It's, it's like round with a lot of uh, flat surfaces on it, but it's fairly round. And so is silt. So silt and sand, uh, sand are the bigger round chunks of, of, of quartz. And if you look at soil underneath a magnifying glass, especially if it's moist, you'll see it looks like crystals. It does actually look like crystals. So the bigger pieces are sand, and if this was to scale, these tennis balls would actually be beach balls, much larger. And then the smaller round particles would be the silt, which are usually one-tenth to one-twentieth the size of sand. That's your tennis uh, uh, ping-pong balls in here. And then clay, clay particles are actually flat. So the clay molecules are very flat, and we put lentil seeds in here. Actually, I should have put confetti uh, in here. Would be a more, a little better, be a little flatter than the lentil seeds, but still, uh, you can kind of see what's going on here. So, if you have a very sandy soil, now round particles, if you put them in a container like this, if these round particles are solid, they make up. 66% of the volume, or about two-thirds of the volume of this, is solid round particles. The spaces between them, one-third. So if you have a sandy soil, if you have pure sand, it's one-third air. The air, and it's very permeable. So we mentioned if the soil breathes well, it's highly permeable. The size of the spaces has a lot to do with how easily the air passes. So if the spaces are too tiny, there's a lot of friction there. The air has trouble moving through it. But sand, the particles are so big and the gaps are so big that air flows very freely through sand and the soil is very permeable. So it's, the air gets through there very well. Clay is almost flat. And even though it's got a lot of air spaces around it, they're so small, so narrow passages that the air has a hard time getting through that. Now, the other thing about soil is, if you look at sand, silt, and clay in a microscope, if you dig it out of the dirt, you'll notice that the particles gleam. Uh, soil has a negative charge. Water ha is ionic. It sticks to sand, silt, and clay. One molecule thick very, very strongly. So almost all the particles in, in soil are coated with water. Now, sand, not much, because sand may be several million molecules thick with only one molecule layer of water on it that's sticking good. It's not holding onto that much water compared 
but clay can be as narrow, as thin as, they said, 28 molecules thick, but it still holds a one molecule layer of water. It's actually holding a lot of water versus its size uh, over sand. So if the soil's got a lot of clay in it, it holds on to water a lot better than sand. Now, what, when they do this study, and they, you know, they have a, a jar full of a foot of sand, they'll notice it takes about half inch of water to soak all the sand and run out the bottom of the, or you know, soak the whole thing. Only about a half inch of water will, will coat all the surface of the sand in a foot container. Clay, though, may take close to two inches. So clay holds a lot more water than sand does. But clay doesn't breathe. So here, this container may be about 8, 10% lentil seeds. If it was 33% lentil seeds, all the gaps to the top of this thing would be filled with these clay particles. And at that point, when you've got like 35% clay in your soil, the air can't get through very well anymore. And suddenly you've got what is called clay. So... It doesn't take much clay, only 35% or so, to fill all the gaps between the other soil particles, and then you've got what is called clay soil. So it doesn't take much clay to make clay soil. Uh, in Orange County, there is no clay soil that we know of that's 100% clay, uh, but there's a lot of areas that are approaching 50% clay. Uh, the hills back here are sandy clay, so they've got enough clay to fill the gaps but they're only about 40% clay. And to make the soil breathe, if you have 40% clay, if you double the amount of sand, you just mix equal parts of sand with this, you'll knock the percentage of clay down below 30%. That soil breathes. So you can add, I've been told by the ag agents, there are any, any clay soil in Orange County, if you add equal parts of sand to it, it'll breathe. It doesn't make it turn into concrete like some people are swearing that if you add sand. I mean, sand and clay are, are two of the ingredients of proper soil. If you add more sand, the soil breathes. If you have more clay, the soil doesn't breathe. Now, the interesting thing about agriculture is that you know the sand, nowadays farmers want sandy loam because it breathes really well. But in the old days, they didn't want sandy loam. Uh, you know, 1800s, there was no irrigation back in those days. This soil that is mostly sand, now let me just write some numbers down. So if you have uh, sand, silt, and clay, sandy loam, which is Santa Ana, most of orange, Anaheim, all of Anaheim, uh, Garden Grove, sandy loam soil is roughly about 60% sand, 30% uh, silt, 10% clay. The numbers can be 5% up or down, or even 10% in some cases up or down, and you still have sandy loam. So it breathes good, doesn't hold a whole lot of water. The Rich loam you'd have about twenty five percent clay and uh, maybe forty percent sand, and that would leave what uh, thirty five percent silt that holds a lot more water, so in the old days. You know, if you go back in history in Orange County, the old the farmers back before 1900 were all in Fountain Valley and Huntington Beach where it was clay soil because they didn't have irrigation. Once the rains were over, this soil held onto the water better. So they were farming beans and things out, out, out in the clay areas. So that was the rich soil. It was the soil that had more clay in it. So there, you know, certainly you can go more, we have more clay than that in a lot of those areas. Uh, it can be like 40%. And then 
in uh, 20, well, still we usually have a lot of sand in there and then 20% silt. But when the clay contents get high, uh, that would be a clay soil. But that's what the farmers wanted back in the old days. So you look, you look at any of the old movies or the old, uh, a lot of the old things, they didn't want the high ground where there was a lot of sand in the soil. They wanted the richer soil near the, where the river slowed down in the valleys where all the clay fell out of the water. And then that became, you know, like here, the, the river is pulling the, water, the soil from the, from the sandy clay hills down to the ocean. Well, sand being the heavier particles falls out first. So this area right here below the hills is very sandy. As the riverbed slows down toward to get to the ocean, then the clay falls out, settles out there. So it's more clay near the ocean than inland, unless the river's running real fast, like through the Liso Canyon or something, then it's, the clay doesn't have a chance there to fall out. So this is how the different soils are in nature. Now, nature has a way of fixing the clay soil so the roots can breathe better. So plants and other organisms in the ground can texture clay soil to, be, to breathe better. And the way they do that, there's a, is a it wasn't discovered too long ago. There's a fungus in the ground called a mycorrhizal fungus. Let's turn the page and start. So in nature, um, the soil below the surface, and if you look at the different literatures, they'll say it's either 99.1% mineral to 100% mineral. With the organic content of the soil being from 0.9% to 0% organic. Now the latest literature that we've been getting from the colleges, it's 0%. There is nothing, there's no dead stuff in the ground that they can find when they're doing soil samples. However, all the dead leaves and stuff above the ground, which we call the duff layer, and I keep telling people this, I swear the word duff had to be a combination of dead stuff on top of the ground, but uh, the average depth of that is five inches over the US. So there's five inches of dead stuff on top of the ground, <clears throat> and this is the plant's source of nutrition. The soil itself is not. It's their home. It's like your house. You don't eat your house. Your house can store water or provide you with water and air and all that and insulation. That's what the house does. Uh, all the dead leaves and poop and things that fall on top of the ground, that's the source of plants' nutrition. And what happens in nature is as this stuff is breaking down, so um, plants themselves, dead leaves and things, the main material in that is cellulose. And we know cellulose is wood, cellulose is paper. We make paper out of wood. But cellulose molecules actually are sugar molecules that are rearranged so you can't eat them. So plant leaves make sugar from carbon dioxide and water, energy of sunlight. They transform those materials into sugar. And then the plant changes sugar into cellulose to make the tissue of the plant. So most of this plant is sugar. When you look at it, sugar falls in the ground. Um, now the, sh the cellulose, strands of cellulose that make up the plant are, hell, are glued together in the plant with a chemical made out of sugar called lignin. Very sticky stuff. So as that bacteria and fungi break down the cellulose, the lignin, which nothing eats lignin, is released into the soil below it. It's a real powerful glue. It takes all the little clay and sand particles and glues them into bigger chunks. 
So it takes a real fine textured soil and starts clumping it up into bigger chunks. So it changes essentially clay into sand is what it's doing. So this lignin plays a big role. And then the fungus that's up in here eating this stuff up. Now most of nature, you know, uh, people have been making compost piles for 30, 40 years now, uh, thinking that that's how nature recycles nutrients. Well, most of nature is not recycled by compost organisms. It's recycled by mycorrhizal fungi. Now, in, in Europe, there's a famous one. It's called the truffle. So the truffle fungi are attached to the roots of oak trees. They are up here in the duff layer of this, above the ground, and they're eating all the leaves up, giving the nutrients back to the oak tree directly break, as they break this stuff down. So that's the role of that's, this duff layer is where the mycorrhizal fungus lives, but it's also attached to the roots in the ground. They said the mycorrhizal fungus makes this structure in the soil looks like steel girders, supports the soil, makes the soil very, very firm, the lignin is gluing the particles into bigger chunks, and then you have a lot of worms in the ground, both ones you can see and ones you can't see, that are creating all these pathways through the soil as they travel through it. They sold the, so underneath an, an older tree or any place in a, in a city where they, no one's touched the ground for a while, they said the soil looks like Swiss cheese. Very, very airy, so the air just goes right through it. So that's how nature can take even clay soil and make it very breathable. Soil makes, you know, makes the soil better for the plants that are living in it. Okay, so that's good soil. Now, if you have bad soil, how can you make it better? Well, you can just stick dead stuff. Com, you know, compost, dead, mulch, organic mulches, lay them top of the ground, um, keep them moist, and nature will do all this stuff for you. Of course, it takes a while. It may take uh, months to years to change clay soil into better soil. So what can you do immediately that will make it breathe better? Well, you can, of course, you can take it and add sand to it. You can take, you know, if you've got real clay soil, but the problem with the sand is you almost you have to double the volume. So if you want to improve the soil a foot deep, you've got to add a foot of soil, of sand to that soil to do that. Your soil is going to be a foot higher. If you can handle the height, not a problem. But if you can't handle the height, you really can't do it. Now, the thing about plants, even these plants, is that they can live in clay soil. The problem we're having is that they can't because of what the growers did to them. So the problem we have right now is that most growers are being taught to grow their plants in some form of compost. Big problem. And almost every potting soil you buy is around, you know, even the cactus mixes, they're about 70% organic still, which means 70% dead tree to virtually 100% dead tree. And the problem with dead stuff, especially when you bury it, if it's sitting on the surface of the soil, it's decomposing, there's plenty of oxygen up there, it doesn't cause trouble when it's above the ground. When you bury it, it's like you're making a landfill. You put uh, dead stuff in the ground, or in, in the case of this, in a pot. It doesn't breathe as well as it does if it was this fluffy above the ground. It's surrounded by this imp you know, this non-breathable material and it's a compost pile inside this pot. What happens is the oxygen level that is decomposing, the oxygen is used up when things decompose. Now we have, I have debated with compost people in the past, they tell me that they're using finished compost to grow plants in. Well, finished compost, when compost finishes decomposing, it's carbon dioxide and water. There's no such thing as solid 
finished compost. Any type of wood particle that is is there is still decomposing till it's gone. It's still decomposing. So it's still using up the oxygen. Now there's a period of hot decomposition. So what they're talking about is when they make potting soil out of wood, they've got to hot decompose it for at least two or three months because some things decompose at a real high rate in wood and it creates too much heat for the plants to live in it. So they've got to get rid of that period of decomposition first. And then from then on, it's slow decomposition until the stuff is gone, but it's still decomposing using up oxygen. So, and that lack of oxygen is what causes plants to rot. So this English lavender here is showing signs of missing roots. It's starting to turn, the leaves starting to turn brown. And that to us is a sign of no roots left. And if you sink this into the dirt, you're even worse off than you were in here. At least this pot has air holes at the bottom. But you sink this root ball into the ground, there's no more air holes underneath it. It's in real big trouble if it's got compost around these roots because we find English lavender, just, you know, just a teaspoon of compost around that root ball can rot it out. It's that sensitive to lack of oxygen um, in its root system and the crown of the plant. So the big problem we have is the plants they make. Now, another problem that we have, even if you grow it properly, is this root ball is a, oh, is a foot deep. And it has air holes at the bottom of this pot. You put this in the ground and it's a foot deep. There's no air holes at the bottom. Suddenly the roots down here can't breathe as well as they do up as they did before. So even though the soil, you know, we grew this, so this is this soil breathes well, but here we may lose the bottom roots of part of this root system because it's no longer breathing. So what we tell people to do if they're growing plants, especially in larger containers in the ground. So if you have a perfect plant like our plant and you put it in soil, especially if it's clay soil, if it's sandy soil, if you live in Anaheim, you can throw any of these plants in there and it's so airy that they're not going to rot. The soil, if the soil is very sandy, you can make all kinds of mistakes with compost and everything still lives. But if you are in the hills here with sandy clay and you've got this plant that's got a root system that's a foot or deeper, then it's nice to artificially make the soil breathe better right around the edges. And the way you do that is you mix pumice. Now we sell bags of pumice or you can mix our acid mix which is half pumice and half peat moss into the soil around here or even just backfill with just straight this. It'll breathe. And what will happen is that gives the chance, plants a chance to keep these roots alive and the new roots grow out into this they hit the clay soil, they can go in, now they're, they're still, the clay generally breathes about six inches deep or so, so they'll go in six inches, find there's no more air there, and then they'll head up closer to the surface and exist where they can in that clay soil. But that keeps them alive in the meantime. If you have this in the ground surrounded by regular conventional planter mix, which is compost, you just killed the thing. The regular planter mix, which is pretty much 100% compost. If you've got heavy soil, now again, if you have sandy soil, it can still work. Everything works in sand, but if you have heavy soil and you mix it with compost, this soil becomes very low on oxygen. The roots can't get in there. They can't live in here. They can't live in there. The plant just slowly loses its roots. You, the leaves start turning brown on you. Um, get like this, the plant starts collapsing, and then you'll go back to the nursery that sold you all this stuff, and they'll tell you you're overwatering it. They'll blame the water because that's what they've been told. Now, it is true, if you hardly water this soil, the air gets penetrates it better than if, if, if there's a lot of water in there. But if the water has enough oxygen in it, there's not, a, there's not an issue. 
So if you took all this, if there was no organic compost in here at all, and you water a lot, the plant's not going to die. There's enough oxygen in that water for most cases, so it, it can survive. So um, bigger plants, no matter if we grow them or not, if you have heavy soil, it's nice to get a lot of air in around them with pumice rock, sand. I've had landscapers tell me that they've been doing this for 30 years. Whenever they plant a plant in the ground, they just run it with pure sand, and they don't lose anything. So the, some landscapers learn. I've seen specs for commercial developments where they put the big box trees around, and their spec is put the sand around them. They know that works. Not compost. Compost is the last thing you want to put in the ground. You don't want to put dead, rotting things in the ground with your plants. They do not like that. But pure sand can breathe. Pumice rock breathes quite well. Pumice doesn't hold water very well. That's the one issue with it. But as long as you're watering, then you're fine with that too. Perlite is similar to pumice. Uh, so both pumice and perlite are expanded quartz crystals. So if you take uh, quartz that has some water in it and you put it in an oven and pop it, you get perlite. Uh, pumice is made in a volcano, so the quartz rot, the molten quartz has a lot of volcanic gases that ran through it, makes it very lightweight too. Pumice, at least the pumice that we sell, because there are pumices out there that are just like perlite. In fact, uh, I have a sample at my house of, of a pumice rock. You can put in your hand and blow on it and it just floats. It's so lightweight. But that's one of the problems with perlite. You put it in the ground and it floats up to the surface because it's lighter than everything around it. Pumice tends to be heavy enough that it doesn't float as badly as the perlite in general. But you can add that. You can add sand. You can add anything coarse, gravel even, uh, to the ground to make it breathe better. Now, one of the reasons why growers put uh, compost in to grow plants in is because container plants need coarser soil than the ground does. Um, the problem with containers is that the containers that the nursery industry uses are not porous. The water won't be sucked out of them. So in the ground, the ground is like an endless sponge, so the water gets pulled through the dry soil and it gets pulled out. Now, I should mention, so if you have soil that's clay, and especially if it's a low spot in your garden and the water sits there for weeks and weeks and weeks, that's when water sitting can become a problem because the roots and the other organisms in the soil that are using the oxygen up, eventually use all the oxygen up and the roots start suffocating and then they rot. So even in, if there's no organic matter at all, if the water sits there long enough, uh, it can only, you know, sometimes just a week in the summer when things are more active, there's more oxygen being used, or a couple months in the winter, um, if the water sits there and sits there, then plant roots start rotting in it. Now normally, if the soil is normal, it's like an end of series of sponges, the water just gets pulled down through the sponges, but what happens here is that if there's nothing porous below it, if there's no more soil below it, like what happens in a container, the water just sits at the bottom. It's the soil itself has a hold on the water, won't let it out. And if you've got real dirt in a pot of this size, this, what is called a um, perched water table, can be up to here if it's real dirt. So this whole thing is staying too wet, stays wet too long, this plant will rot even if it's natural soil, not compost in there. So what happens, the coarser you make the soil particles, the lower, the more shallow this perched water table becomes. So in the old days, instead of growing this in sandy loam, we grew plants in soil that was almost pure sand which the lower perched water table 
The problem with pure sand is that this pot would weigh about 20 pounds. This plant here would weigh about 100. And when I was a kid, plants were heavy because we used real dirt. Very sandy dirt, but we used real dirt. So in the 1950s, um, I guess the industry concluded that women couldn't shop at nurseries because they couldn't lift anything up. You know, it's a gender bias there. But um, so they vowed to make plants lighter. So the universities told them, well, if you make it half peat moss and half sand, it'll be half the weight. Well, peat moss has always been a pricey, but peat moss works even though peat moss is dead. It's been sitting at the bottom of the lake for 10,000, 20,000 years. It decomposes really slowly compared to wood. So you can put this in water and the water doesn't stink up. You put, you put compost, wood compost in a bucket of water, three days it smells like a sewer. This stuff, bucket of water, six months, no smell. It's been sitting at the bottom of the lake for a long time. It doesn't decompose. There's not much left to decompose in here. It still can, but it's very slow. It doesn't seem to cause any trouble. So the original formula for container plants with half sand, half peat moss. So peat moss has always been pricey. The industry asked them, what can we do besides peat moss? So they came up with fir bark. So they said, well, maybe one-third fir bark, one-third peat moss, one-third sand. And so for 20 years, that worked for the industry. There was bark in there, it was decomposing real fast, but it was only one-third. So we had pretty good success. But uh, unfortunately, uh, at some colleges, they decided, well, let's see what happens if you make it 100% bark. And suddenly the plants grew faster because the bark was coarser, so the air got through better, and so the plants are growing faster. They said, oh, plants grow better in pure bark than they do in those other mixes you were making before because the soil, the sand was blocking the movement of the air. So they started growing plants in pure bark. The problem with pure bark is, is that for, they said for a five month period, it's perfect as a soil medium. Three more months after that, it becomes a toxic medium because it's breaking down, it becomes less permeable, the air can't get through there, it's still decomposing, everything starts rotting. But the way our industry in the United States works is that for most parts of the U.S., they sell plants in the spring and the nurseries get rid of them all before fall because it gets too cold. Everything freezes in pots. So if you're in Minnesota, Chicago, Kansas City, you get your plants in spring and you sell them before they ever get ugly because you don't have you only have three months to sell your plants. Spring, uh, mid spring through midsummer, the plants are there. By fall, they're gone out of your store. You make sure they're gone because they'll freeze if they sit in the winter. But in California, we want to grow things in pots year round, and this stuff doesn't last that long. It only lasts. We heard five months is maximum for ground up wood as a soil medium. So all the potting soils they make for most United States are made out of ground wood because that's the only length of time they need to make it work. And then here we're stuck with this. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, put this in the ground, a lot of times it still dies because this wood is still decomposing in there, still creating low oxygen levels right in the middle of this root ball. And that can, that's enough to take out the lavender, uh, kangaroo paws, gardenias, a lot of things rot. In fact, uh, we've, you know, we've, uh, depending on the nursery that we know their soil mixes, we've learned it over the years. Um, I know that one nursery that we've got plants from in our own garden 20, 25 years ago, everything they, they grew on us died within three years. And a lot of it, exactly at three years, died in another nursery, five years in the ground, died. Another nursery, ten years in the ground, and they started to turn ugly. Uh, but we had three other nurseries, none of their plants ever died in our yard. Twenty years later, it still looked the same. And they were the same types of plants. 
It was like the grower's soil determined how long those plants lived in our garden. I called them up. They have no clue. And they learned how to make their soil in college, so they're not about to listen to me without the Ph.D. So uh, that's the state of our industry. So we, over the years, starting in the early 90s, learned how to fix these things. Some plants hard to fix. I'll tell you, lavender is really hard to fix. The one speck of organic matter around that crown of that plant still kill it. And gardenias, we seem to be able to fix them, but we found that we can fix them. They still look good. Half year later, they start dying on us. They don't like the root stuff we do to them, so we've given up trying to fix those. But a lot of plants, we never lose. So citrus trees, uh, we haven't found a single citrus grower that serves retail nurseries in Southern California that grows them in real dirt. Now, the commercial growers, a lot of them grow their stuff in pure sand. Or in peat, moss, and perlite, no problems. So the commercial growers get the better plants. Retail grow customers get stuck with the stuff grown in sawdust or ground up, some kind of ground up wood. So when we were carrying citrus a year ago, what we would do is the moment we got them, we would shake off all the soil, put them into our top pot. Now, we made these 25 years ago when we found out how bad regular potting soil was. So regular potting soils, a lot of them are totally ground up wood. We don't know how they get away with that, but what's interesting is the California EPA considers potting soil to be wood-based. They had trouble, we had trouble getting our potting soils, the labels on them through the EPA because they said, what are you making? <laughs> they didn't, they couldn't understand it because they were taught that potting soils got to be based on wood or bark. One of those two items. So it's really strange what has happened in California. Um, in fact, the saddest thing we've heard um, a number of years ago, I think this was 2007, the city of Santa Monica sued the grower. They had bought all these box trees. They were uh, strawberry trees, Arbutus marinas, from a nursery that's now gone, uh, went out of business, and planted them in their city in the meeting strips, and they all rotted and died within a few years, so they sued the company. The lower court says, yeah, they all rotted. It must be the grower's fault took it to the state courts of California, and the state court says, well, this grower followed exactly what the university told them how to plant it and grow it, so they can't be at fault. So they overturned that ruling that said it was the nursery's fault that the plants all died from root rot. Uh, in fact, I mentioned my email this week, finally met someone from the universities. Uh, Mateo Garbal Garbalito, I believe his name was. Um, there, he's with the Forest Department of University of California, Berkeley, and they're studying how all the reforestation products, the plants are rotting in there because they're buying them or getting them from nurseries, growing them in yeah. in uh, organic matter, and they put them in the field, and it says they're all they all got this fungus on them when they plant them. That's what they're finding. They're all rotting. So I, I emailed them and says, yeah, I know why. It's because they're using ground up wood as a growing medium. And he says, yeah, I've been watching this for years now, and I concur. First guy I've ever heard from the universities that said, yeah, we agree. There's something wrong with the industry, with the practices that they do. So, but, I don't know, he's not part of the horticultural side of the universities. I wish that Someone would just come out and tell the, the growers, stop doing this. Don't grow them in dead trees. But uh, anyway, we made our own potting soils back in the 90s, or mid-90s. Um, we made this one first. So we, we asked the guys, what's the lightest form of quartz that we can get? Pumice rock. The lightest natural form of, of quartz. It's pumice, so he put pumice in there, but we need to hold more water because pumice dries out 
too quickly. Doesn't hold enough water. So I asked them, what's the most water retention material that's lightweight? They said it's peat moss. So this is half pumice, half peat moss. The peat moss does decompose, but it doesn't seem to cause any root rot problems, but it does shrink a bit over time. We generally use this for everything that needs a lot of acidity because peat moss is acidic. Uh, ferns, blueberries, azaleas, but we find that flowers and vegetables do great in it, so we've used that for that, that purposes for the last generation. We wanted to make something that didn't shrink, so we found out if we got the peat moss volume down to about one third, this is about one third peat, that it no longer seems to lose volume. We think what's happening is that within the soil structure, so we have volcanic rock, sponge rock, sand, and charcoal. Now, charcoal is interesting. So charcoal is inert. It's a form of organic matter that's totally inert, but it, it is what makes the black rich souls of the world both black and rich, the charcoal content. Charcoal is used as filters because it collects all the minerals. Everything sticks to charcoal. And plants love to live around charcoal and so do a lot of other organisms. So in nature, they said a soil content, charcoal content of only 2% makes the soils look black and be real rich. It's interesting, only 2%. <laughs> um, now, we see a lot of journal, journals and magazines and newspapers saying you want to make your soil rich and black by adding a lot of compost to it. Well, when you do that, the reason why this stuff is black, sewer gases, which are totally toxic. You're killing your soil off by making it black. And a lot of growers have noticed that. They notice if their soils turn black, the plants no longer lived in it. So you do this to your soil, you've just killed your whole yard. So don't do that. Charcoal is one way. So we put charcoal in here just to do that. But it seems that at one-third peat moss, it doesn't contribute to volume. It's sitting between the bigger particles in here. Peat moss is like brown hair. So it seems to sit between the particles. When peat moss eventually shrinks and goes away, the soil level doesn't drop in, our, in this stuff. Or it doesn't appear to. Uh, it could be that the root volume is making up for the lowering peat moss levels. So we're not quite sure, but it seems to serve our purposes of being a permanent, non-shrinking potting soil. And the other reason we put a lot of different minerals in it, materials in there, is that, um, like if you make a soil out of pure peat, it holds a lot of water. But the problem with that is that it's, it's wet, 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 and suddenly it's totally dry. And the plant wilts really badly. And we think when it's a sudden change of moisture like that, uh, it, the plant doesn't have time to react. So we know we think the more types of particles are in the soil, you know, this, say the sand dries off first, and the perlite dries next, and the charcoal dries next, and the pumice dries after that, and then the peat moss finally dries, the plant shuts down more gradually and doesn't tend to wilt on us as badly as it does with pure peat. So we like the different materials to make soils out of. We think the more different materials are in there, the better the plants respond to that drying process and wetting process. Um, now, there's a, I have a magazine article, a research magazine from Holland. So in Holland, they've done a lot of research on growing plants in containers because in Holland, their main industry is hothouse growing of crops, either vegetable crops or flower crops for all of Europe. They're kind of like the breadbasket of Europe, and they do it in greenhouses. So they've known potting soils for a long time, and they've, they've studied how to make potting soils over the years. Um, they said the materials that work for them, sand works, Perlite works, pumice works. Uh, clay pellets are real interesting. I'll leave that there. Uh, spun rock or spun glass. This is actually some type of rock that's spun to make it spongy. 
works quite well. Among the organic materials, they found that rice hulls, peat moss, and coconut core can work. They said that these materials have a known lifespan, so they can tell the farmer how long they'll last. So peat moss will stay permeable because it holds water really well. All these, uh, these two organic materials hold water really well, but they become non-permeable in a certain amount of time. Peat moss tends to be a little over a year, coconut core about like that, but most crops don't live that long, so they're fine with these materials as a growing medium. I wouldn't use it on anything permanent, pure this or this, but for the time that they need the crop, they said they can work, they can predict them. Rice holes are interesting. They tend to not break down at all. Rice holes in nature tend to be 90% silica. So they said that rice holes last essentially forever. For As far as our lifetime is concerned, rice holes are permanent. So you can use this as a permanent potting soil. You know, we wanted to use this as part of our potting soil mix to make it lighter, but the uh, people who make our potting soil don't like to handle rice soles because they have everything piled up outside. These things just blow all over the place. They're so light, so they don't use it. But if I had a choice, I would make this part of our potting soil to make it lighter, but uh, we don't have that option. So the, uh, so in Holland, you know, Europe invented the system of moving material with pallets. So they have a lot of wood, waste wood, all around the place because they invented pallets and forklifts and stuff like that that we copied. So they have all this old wood that they wanted to try to see if they can use. They said, can't make it work. They said they tried wood, they tried bark, which is a bypro you know, by, uh, byproduct of sawmills. They said, the problem with wood is that one part of a piece of wood decomposes really fast, other parts of it decompose real slow. They have no clue when they're using wood or bark how long it will last for the farmer. So they can't use it. Of course, in the U.S., it's all they use. And we've heard some growers tell us that they lost their entire crop because they had a bad batch of bark. In Europe, they already know you cannot depend on wood or bark as a growing medium, it's just too variable among different parts of the tree or different trees. Uh, it's too variable. But in the U.S., that's what we're doing. We're using bark or wood. Of course, I guess for the three months it takes them to start the plant in the pot, it may work. Most crops, uh, you know, it's it would, you know, most. If you're living off the crop itself, then you wouldn't use that. They're selling the plant before it dies, so. So anyway, uh, one of the, um, the most effective growing mediums is clay in the form of pellets. So clay holds water, but it doesn't breathe. Well, if you make it into pellets, it does both. So this is really high-priced stuff, clay pellets, compared to anything else that's more natural. But it works really well on a lot of crops. So in agriculture, the most expensive crops you use the most expensive growing medium. And in the U.S., it's marijuana. So you go on a marijuana farm, they use a lot of clay pellets because that's the best growing medium you can think of. Faster, works better, um, in a greenhouse. I would say outside dries up a little too fast for outside, but in greenhouses, uh, controlled environment places, this is like the best soil they've come up with, clay pellets. Okay, last thing would be how to fix the plants that we sell. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, for many years, we would just take a plant and take the hose, water's the most gentle way to remove soil, uh, and hose it off. But ever since the drought started, we've been a little more conscientious 
we use water sometimes. If the plant's real viable, we'll just still, you know, get the hose out, put a little valve at the end, turn it so it's just a little sliver of water coming out. It's like cuts through the, the soil particles real well. But a number of years ago, I had my son here helping me change dirt on citrus trees, and he came up with a different method. And I was going to yell at him when he first started doing this, but he started doing this. Just dropping it on the ground to loosen up the soil. And if you drop on a flat surface, you really don't break that many roots, apparently. Because we never lost a single tree that he did. So I said, okay, well, this is faster than doing either using water or just... You know, when I was taught, I was taught by a soil scientist that wasn't working for University of California. He was kind of independent research. said, you got to get the stuff off the roots. And, and it was real interesting. So the first plant I ever did back in the early 90s, he said, bring the plant that's most sensitive to water. And at that time, we were growing papayas and super soil because I thought super soil had to be really good. Well, if you watered the papaya two days in a row, it rotted and fell out of the pot. You'd have to wait till that soil was totally dry so the air can get back in through there and get it oxygenated again. And if you didn't do that, it was still wet two days in a row. The roots just rotted that fast. The thing just turned yellow and fell over. So he says, well, he gave me an ice pick. So that's how he did it, with an ice pick. He said, just carefully remove all this potting soil around the roots and watch what the plant does. He wasn't even going to tell me what was going to happen. He just wanted me to experience what happens when the roots can breathe. So my papaya plants were like this. And after about half an hour of picking at the roots, uh, taking the potting soil off, I noticed that they had done this. They had gone, all the leaves went up in the air like this. I was going, I told him, that plant looks a lot happier. <laughs> I had just, just taken off that much dirt. It looks a lot happier. Just like it can can breathe again. It's just amazing to me that, and the color changes too. You pick off the soil off the root, take the compost off the roots, it's like the next day the plants are greener. Even the next hour, they're greener. It's just really weird what the, what the compost around the roots does to plants. So you can loosen it up, but you know if you just drop it, on a firm surface, this table isn't the best, you know, concrete is better, wood is better, but you can knock a lot of it off. Uh, plants, you know, if you lose half the root system, it's not too bad. Now, I'm noticing in the middle of this root ball, on this side, the roots are all brown. This side, they're white. This side, these are already dead, so they're already rotting. If you hose that area, all those roots just fall off. They just slough right off the plant. But the white ones are still alive. So you can shoot it off with water or you can work it with a chopstick. Usually uh, I sharpen the, edge, the tip of it on the ground on the at pavement to get in the roots better. This is kind of a flat spoon-shaped tip to this little probe, which really is nice. Jim Dockstater gave this to me. And if you get it to a certain point, then suddenly it's easier then to switch and just start tapping the stem. Now if a big clod is on one root, it might break that whole root off so you kind of break up the clods with your either with your hand or with the stick but it turns out if you start beating on the stem of the plant or trunk of a tree that vibration takes off most of the rest of it let's pull this weed out the weed roots are probably better than the plant roots are Yeah, most weeds can handle poorer soil conditions than plants than the plants we grow. So now this does shock the plant. So what you have to do when you replant it 
is it's got to be shaded for at least half the day for two weeks. It takes two weeks for plants to recover. I mean, it can be total light shade. If, if it's an indoor plant, you don't have to do anything indoors. There's not enough um, exposure to sunlight to... Because what happens is, is if they're in sun, the leaves are using a lot of water, losing a lot of water. Roots aren't able to bring it up real fast because I've just shocked them. So it takes two weeks to, rep to recover from this. So for the next two weeks, you either put this plant in the shade or you shade it. Now in a plant in a garden, just putting a large object next to it in the ground on the south side is usually enough to do it. Uh, what I did when I used to live next to a, a green belt is I would climb over the wall, cut off big branches off of the green belt trees and use them as parasols. The leaves would shrivel and fall off, but it would last a couple of weeks. And just shade the plants that I was doing. And then after two weeks, they're fine, they get going. Now, a lot of plants, no matter what, will survive. So I did a citrus tree once. It was June gloom or May gloom, and it was cloudy. I said, ah, don't need to shade this thing. Uh, the next day, the sun came out. It was 85 degrees. All the leaves fell off. I thought, okay, that tree's in trouble. But what we've learned is that if the leaves fall off, the plant is saving itself. They shed their leaves to save themselves. A month later, totally refoliated. Never had a problem from that point on. So we started doing that with a lot of plants. Um, we have some bougainvilleas in front of some of our columns out on the street here. So uh, two years ago, I had my, one of my new employees do this. I said, plant these out there, shake off all the dirt, and put them in the ground. He goes, that's going to kill them. I said, no, it won't. Uh, so we cut the plants down one-third and put them in the ground. And a couple of days later, he says, all the leaves are falling off. It's dying. I said, no, just watch the plant. So uh, about a month later, it totally grew back, and this was, uh, I can't remember what time here, I think it was fall we did this, and then the plants started blooming right in the middle of winter, and they never stopped blooming ever again. So without that compost around them, they look a lot, you know, for us, bougainvilleas in the wintertime in the containers with the compost would drop their flowers, and if the winter was cool and wet enough, they'd drop their leaves. And then when the weather got warmer in the spring, they would grow them back and they would look good again. But we couldn't sell them at all in the wintertime. Well, once we started changing the soil in the bougainvilleas, they never went to sleep. Now, the other thing we think that goes on with the compost is that the edge of a pot, because plastic shrinks and expands, there's an air gap around the edge of this pot. So most of the roots that survive in a pot will survive around the edge of the pot, but nothing in the middle. The problem in the wintertime is that the pot gets real cold, a lot colder than the ground does. The center of the pot doesn't, but all the roots are on the edge or on the top where it's too cold, so it puts the bougainvillea to sleep. The roots just all f freeze or die that way because of the cold. But when we put better soil in the pot, the roots live in the middle of the pot where it's insulated, and they just keep blooming. They don't stop in the ground. They'll bloom year-round. But in containers, they can get really ugly because of the soil. The soil is forcing the roots to the edge of the pot where, they, where they're more subject to the cold. So uh, let's... Uh, all right. Cat's got it. Oh, that's... Uh, anything organic is would you can call it compost. When I bought the bags of topsoil, I can use that instead of compost. Our, you mean our top pot potting soil? Okay, yeah. Make sure you don't get that mixed up. Okay. Topsoil, anything called topsoil is usually half, close to half organic. Our top pot doesn't have anything in it that'll decompose badly in water, so our top pot is is pretty sterile. So now in, in containers, so we'll put this back in a container with our top pot potting soil. So it's, again, it's peat moss, volcanic rock, sponge rock, sand, and charcoal. Now it's easy in this container because 
it's easy to distribute the soil through the roots because I can actually shake the pot. You know, you can't shake the ground. But I can shake the pot so that the soil and the roots are distributed well. On the ground, you've got to try to open up the root system a little bit so that the soil doesn't put them all together in the center because, you know, in nature, soil, the roots are usually about a quarter inch apart. If they're all packed together, they can't breathe either. So it's nice to get them separated a little bit at least. Or you can, you know, you can put a mound of soil on the ground and spread the roots over the mound if you can to separate them. In this pot, I just shake it a lot. And the roots in the soil will distribute themselves fairly well. And then usually we fertilize it after that too. And then they can get going as far as growing again. In containers, and we'll talk about that more next week, uh, they need a constant source of fertilizer because the most potting soils do not hold fertilizer well. So it just passes through, so it's almost constant. Um, we happen to use a lot in the nursery and containers this osmocote because it's a time release over six months. Uh, organic fertilizers also release over a period of time. You can probably do organics once a month in a pot and, and get away with that. Water soluble fertilizers like Miracle Grow, you'd have to do every couple of weeks because it just flushes right through. So it depends what you're using. We like this because it's just less work for us. We don't have to think about it. Um, but a lot of our customers do this with every plant they plant now, unless we grow it. Uh, it really helps them out. There's a lot of plants that are totally different when you start taking the soil off. They look, you know, the things that are supposed to have blue leaves look a lot bluer. The things that have silver leaves look a lot more silvery. I've been to some nurseries where they use too much compost. All the plants have the same yellow-green color. Yellow-green, well, it's kind of an orangey yellow-green especially some succulent nurseries. You go to the succulent nurseries, all the succulents have the same color. But when you grow them in good soil, then they have their own characteristic blues and yellows and greens and red foliage. They, they show their better colors that way. Um, when you see a brown tip on a leaf or a yellow and brown tip, that usually means they don't have any roots. The roots are bad. I mean, we're amazed um, some of the growers we've taken plants out of, the plant is surviving on one root about five inches long or so. The soil is so bad. We, we have growers that use straight cedar mulch to grow plants in, and we just don't see any, hardly any roots in there at all. It's a crime what they're trying to sell people. Well, they'll grow faster. So succulents, uh, you know, most people tell you don't water too much, don't fertilize too much. We find if we water succulents every day and fertilize them a lot, they grow a lot faster, just like plumerias. Most plumerias, you know, in the soil that they use, you can't water them but once a week. Well, we water them every day. They'll grow three feet a year if they're in the right dirt. Don't have to stop. Still well, it rains. We don't care. We don't. The at the nursery here, you know, we this time we we're watering about twice a week, but it doesn't hurt plants to water them. Right. Right. So a lot of people will tell you don't water because the soil they're using will rot the plant. The soil they're using will take all the oxygen out of the water. So you have to let it dry out to get the oxygen back in there because the water doesn't have any oxygen in it. The soil mix they're using takes it out. So um, any questions today? Next week we're going to talk about water, more about watering, fertilizing, and all the other practices that we do. But this week we want to get the soil done right. So. So the, uh, the people who make topsoil know how to work a tractor and a dump truck, and that's about all they know about plants. Uh, they think that 
You know, they sell, they have sandy loam, but they don't think it's good enough. Because there is no nutrition in dirt. I mean, the, the universities have, you know, the ag department knows this, the agricultural in, uh, industry knows this. They said, the richest soils in the world, you might be able, you might be able to grow a one three-month crop on it. There's just not enough nutrition soil to grow anything. Um, so the people who make topsoil think if you mix this with manure and compost of some sort, it becomes a better soil. So most of the, quote, topsoils out there are about 40% organic, which, you know, when you consider soil nature is point, <coughs> excuse me, point 0.9 to 0% organic, that's a killer. And that's how I learned about dirt. So 20 years ago when I bought my last house, <clears throat> we had all these planters to fill. I wanted to fill them eight inches of, of good soil. So I called up the soil company and said, what do I fill these with? They said, our top soil. They call it top soil C. 60% sandy loam, 40% their, their, this special mulch they made that was horse manure mixed with uh, wood products, composted wood products. So I filled all our beds with it. Things looked good initially, but within half a year, I had bananas falling over, rotten, uh, lost bougainvilleas, lost gardenias, lost avocado trees, uh, lost about half the things in our yard. We're going, all right, how come I can't grow plants? So in my first house, we hadn't, we didn't fill any, we didn't bring any topsoil in, and everything was fine. Everything worked like it was supposed to work. Uh, but at this house, we filled all these beds up with this supposedly perfect soil. What are we doing wrong? Well, it took me three years, and I had to talk to the soil scientists from NASA, and we said, okay, there's no organic matter in the ground. He says, he told me, whenever there's organic matter around any root, that root turns brown. And he says they, they figure it out because they're in Hawaii vacationing. I guess they get paid a lot, these guys that work for NASA. And they noticed that how lush the forests were and it's just straight volcanic rock. He says there's no organic matter in the ground. So he was growing all his plants out in Laguna Niguel in pure volcanic rock. So... So I got into that. I said, well, that, that's, that looks pretty good. So we started doing all our own testing and pure sand and sand beat everything. So the problem with sand is just the weight. So pure sand was the original potting soil. My father's bonsai book said that. So in bonsai, they've been working with potted plants for thousands of years now. And they said sand is the most vigorous growing medium. But for bonsai, we don't want that because... We don't want plants with big leaves. Bonsai, everything's miniature. So they add cl enough clay to the sand to shrink the growth rate and everything down. But they said, the plant starts rotting in there, take all the soil off, put it back in the sand until it recovers. So they knew that sand was the best potting soil. Even in Europe, the original uh, orangeries in France, where they had huge concrete pots, orange trees in them, they analyzed the soil in those pots. It was 97% sand. <clears throat> so that's the original potting soil. But this wood stuff that we're using now is horrid. So. How often does this have to be replanted? That'll be next week. Now, truthfully, in a pot, like in bonsai, a minimum every 10 years, they pull the plant out because what happens is every year the plant grows new roots and those roots die and grow new roots. So the, the soil gets filled with dead plant roots and they can't be in there too much longer. So every 10 years minimum. Uh, some plants you do every two years, some every five. The slowest growing plants every 10. Pull it out, shave off half the dirt, put new dirt in there, away you go for another 10 years. I watched my father do that with his bonsai plants. Well, this plant wants to be a tree, but uh, if you can trim and keep in there. I, I, every 10 years might work. This is actually a fairly slow-growing plant. Uh, Michelia, which is a magnolia family. This is a really uh, highly, I would say, one of our favorite plants. Banana-colored flowers with a real fruity fragrance. 
really strong fruity fragrance. Okay. Thank you. It's out there. Celestial. I think that was celestial blue. Celestial blue. That was the picture. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. What is the smallest size of that? Uh, Barrel is this 